Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for lesson three, interact with the physical world with sensors and actuators. This is part of our Hello IoT series, which ran last week and this week. I will share a link to the series page where you can find the past sessions recordings and register for upcoming sessions here in just a few minutes. Before we get started, I want to go over a few quick things. Please take a few moments to read our code of conduct. We ask that you please be respectful to everybody, including other attendees and our speaker. We want to have a welcoming and safe environment for all. If you haven't already, please check in using our event check-in at aka.ms slash reactor check-in with event ID 13423. By checking in, you'll receive links for today's links to content that go along with today's session. Please ask questions using the live chat. You should see two text boxes. The top one has a question mark over it. That is the live event Q&A. In the chat, I'll be sharing some links to the Reactor Meetup page and monthly newsletter if you're interested in checking out what other sessions we have. Today's session will be added to our Reactor YouTube page in 24 to 48 hours. And finally, towards the end, I will share a link to our Reactor survey. If you have a few minutes, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. I will now pass it over to Jim. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, give me a second while I do my screen share with thing. There we go, and we're going. Great, so welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to week two of our Hello IoT series. Now, in this series, I'm working through some of the beginner lessons, or some of the first lessons in our new IoT for Beginners curriculum. If you joined us last week, then we kicked off with uh, an intro session, kind of introducing the Internet of Things. We then had an office hours, which was on a kind of an open ask me anything type session, which was great fun, had a lot of great conversations with the people. We then had a lesson two, deeper dive. That was Wednesday last week. We d dove more into how microcontrollers work, how single board computers work and understood a bit more about the technology behind IoT. And then we had another office hours last Thursday. Again, more good conversation about how we can use IoT in a lot of good environments. We're going to carry on the same pattern this week. So today we're going to we're on to lesson three, where we're going to be looking at sensors and actuators and how IoT devices can interact with the physical world. Tomorrow we'll, again will be office hours, so a one hour kind of ask me anything. We can talk about the stuff we're doing today. I'll have to run a few more demos and just have any kind of questions about. IoT that you want to ask, we can we can cover tomorrow. Then Wednesday will be uh, well, Wednesday. Wednesday's gonna be all about connecting to the internet. We'll actually look at how we'll do some basic internet connectivity. Look at some of the basic protocols that we, you would use, things like MQTT, and just kind of get an understanding about how you do internet connectivity. And then Thursday we'll wrap up with one last office hours, talking about the stuff we're doing around connectivity. So in terms of everything we're talking about. Before we dive in, for those who are new to this series, I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jim Bennett. I'm an education cloud advocate at Microsoft. So it's my job to help people who are learning anything about anything really to be successful with Microsoft technologies. IoT is kind of my area of specialty. So if you have any questions about learning the Internet of Things, if you're a teacher and you want to bring Internet of Things into your classroom, if you're a student, you want to understand our, our offerings, you want to understand more about how to get going with the technology, you want to help with hackathons, you want help with study groups, get in touch. I'm here to help you be successful. Now, I'm all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett, Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, LinkedIn. Feel free to connect, message me, ask me anything you want, and I will do my best to help you. So the, just the th what we're working through in this series is aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners. So this is our new 24 lesson curriculum that we put together with a combination of folks from Microsoft and our Microsoft Learn Student Ambassadors, which is our community of technology experts who are students at universities all around the world. And we put this together to teach you IoT right from the basics. And this isn't just teaching you a particular IoT service, it's the actual fundamental principles of IoT. So we, we start off with four lessons that we're covering in this particular series where we look at the components of an IoT application, learn a bit more about the hardware, sensors, actuators and basic internet connectivity. Uh, we then have a whole lot of projects covering things like digital agriculture, logistics, manufacturing, retail and consumer IoT devices. And these lessons allow you to kind of learn the, the the basics of IT using projects that cover a lot of the real world scenarios that you would get as an IoT developer. 
Now, so I'm just covering the first four lessons of this particular series, but all the rest of the content is all up on GitHub. It's all completely free, completely open source. So you can just go on there and grab it, work through it, teach it in the classroom, work through it in your study groups, use it to learn how to, to be successful with IoT. Also give a shout out to our friends at Seed Studios. IoT, the T is things and things means hardware. And so to help you get going with the hardware, our friends of Seed have made it reasonably easy to purchase the hardware you need. So rather than having to go to somewhere and say, I want this device and this sensor and this sensor, they've packaged the whole thing up into one kit. So if you follow the link here, this link here, aka slash IoT dash beginners dash kit, that will take you to a seed page where you can do things like a one click purchase of a hardware kit that's got the devices you need and all the sensors. Now, one thing I will say is you don't actually need hardware. We do have a virtual device solution that you can use all the way through this content and you can complete all 24 lessons using simulated devices that are run using Python code that you run locally. But if you do want to buy the hardware, Seed have made it easy to buy. You know, you can just buy one set or you can buy multiple sets if you want to, if, you want to, if you're stocking up for a classroom. All available on the Seed page. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about today's lesson. And today we're going to be interacting with the physical world. So the whole kind of the whole point of IoT is the things interact with the physical world. They gather data using sensors. That data goes to the cloud or other services. Decisions are made and they are converted back to physical interactions using actuators. And that's kind of what we're looking at today. We're going to dive a bit deeper into what are sensors, how they work, what are actuators, how they work, and then we'll actually build a nightlight. If you were here last week when we did a kind of Hello World project with our Weo terminal, we called it Nightlight because we're actually building a nightlight in this particular lesson where the the level of light that is read by a sensor determines whether an LED turns on or off. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about this. The whole, well, the whole thing is going to be two sessions today, two sections, sorry. We have one section on sensors, we look at what they are, we're going to use them and then go into kind of sensor types. And then we're going to do the same with actuators in the second half. So let's start with what are sensors. You think about when Jim, we talk, you, yes. Oh, sorry. Before we get started, the IoT beginners kits link seems to be taking us to the generic Bing page. Um, the ak.ms slash IOT dash beginners dash kits. Uh, ak.ms slash IOT beginners kit. Can you share that link in the chat and I'll go ahead and reshare it? I must have been worded the one that I had. Yeah. It's IoT beginners kit, singular, not plural. I've made that mistake. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've put beginners kit and then wonder why it wasn't working. It's beginners kit. kit. Um, Got it. I should probably Perfect. claim IoT beginners kits as well and uh, add that, <laughs> make that point to the same place. Thank you so much. No worries. No worries. OK, so sensors, you think about your body's senses. We all have senses. They talk about the five senses. Um, obviously, we know that's wrong. Your body has a lot more than five senses. But these are parts of your body that detect physical properties around you, whether it's detecting light reflecting off objects using your eyes to get to, to see, whether you're detecting uh, compression waves in the air via your ears, which is sound, whether you're detecting you're using touch to detect the texture of a surface and the shape of a surface, whether you're using smell to detect chemicals in the air or your tongue to taste chemicals in the food that you're eating, or whether you're telling whether you're lying down or standing up with your sense of balance using um, fluid floating around inside your ears. We all have these senses that we use as humans to measure the physical world around us. Same with animals, same with any most forms of life have some kind of sensors built in that measures properties about the real world. <clears throat> when we talk about these with hardware, we are basically digitizing that particular set of sense. We are using digital devices that measure light, sound, chemicals, motion, and we can use that in our devices and use those to make decisions. And it becomes more, more quantized. You know, we as humans, 
we hear a noise and we can say, yes, it's loud, yes, it's quiet. But with digital devices, with electrical devices, we can actually get a number that reflects that and use that to help us make decisions. And the kind of common sensors, and there's loads and loads of different types of sensors, the kind of common ones you use in the Internet of Things, things like temperature, humidity, buttons. A button is a sensor, it senses whether you've pressed it or not. Light sensors that detect light levels or colours, cameras, accelerometers, microphones, a whole load of different types of sensors, but these are probably the, some of the most common ones that you'd get. In fact, what I'd do, let me zip over to my camera. Let's actually look at some sensors. So this one here, this is a small little circuit board. Doesn't look particularly interesting, but this is a BME 280. Just turn it around so you can actually get the right and the right way up. This is a, come on, focus. You can do it. You can focus on it. This is a BME 280, a pressure, temperature and humidity sensor. And this is quite a popular sensor. It comes in a whole lot of different forms. It's got a lot of pins on the back that you use to connect it to your IoT device. And this allows you to read the temperature, the humidity and the pressure. So if you wanted to put together something to monitor how warm your house is, uh, I've just put up an outdoor pool outside my house. I want to measure the temperature of the water. You could use something like this. Humidity and pressure also good for uh, things like weather. This is very popular as a weather station. You use humidity levels and pressure to, to help you make predictions about what's going to happen with the weather. Another sensor. This is a rotary dial sensor. And so I can, it's got a, it's got a knob on it that I can twist and it measures rotation. What else have we got here? Yeah, a button, a little teeny tiny little button. Senses whether I press the button or not. Uh, this is this one's fun one. This is an ultrasonic distance sensor. So it sends sound out and then listens to the sound to measure how far away things are. Uh, camera. Little tiny camera here. Captures images. This is a sensor you've probably used more than, than others because you'll have one built into your phone. And it's just captures images. It's still a sensor, the, the same as all the others. Now, a little bit of research time, something to think about, something to, we can talk about this more in the office cells tomorrow, but think about your phone. Your phone actually has a lot of sensors. So sensor, the whole purpose of a sensor is it senses something the world around you, quantizes that into electrical signals and that your IoT devices can interpret. And your phone has a load of sensors built in more than just the camera. So something to think about, what sensors does your phone have? Think about it. To talk about in the chat, we can talk about in the office house tomorrow, but a little bit of homework, just have a look, find out what sensors your phone actually has. So before we dive too deep into sensors, let's actually play with one. Let's play with a light sensor and use that to get a value. And then we'll kind of dive a bit deeper into the way sensors work and how they kind of gather, uh, gather different values. So let's do that now. Let's start with a light sensor. I'm going to show you my Wio terminal. So this is the Arduino device we use for this. It's a device from Seed Studios. It's an all-in-one Arduino device. It's got screen, buttons, microphone, little joystick, sockets to plug more stuff in, uh, pins to put more bits and pieces in. Great little device. And on the back here, I don't know if you better make it out, there's a small white square with a circle inside it with a black square inside, or dark gray square inside that. That is a light sensor, and we can use that to measure light values. Now, light sensors come in a number of different types. You can have just a basic one that detects standard uh, vis um, visible light. You can get ones that detect UV light, get ones that detect infrared light. UV light ones are great fun for things like sun sunburn sensors. Yeah, if you've got kids playing outside in the sun, you want to measure them out of UV light to work out do they need to have more sunscreen or do they need to come in? So you can use a UV light sensor for that. Light sensors in general like this, basic ones, can be used for night lights. If you've got young kids and they have a night light that comes on when the room gets dark, it's got a light sensor in it. It's measuring that level of light. So let's actually build one. So this is the, the code we had last week. For those who didn't join us last week, this is uh, extension called Platform.io inside Visual Studio Code. And this is an extension that allows you to program microcontrollers from inside VS Code. Now, we're using the Arduino framework for this. Arduino has two methods of interest 
for those folks who uh, uh, who want to program Arduino. The setup and loop. So the way Arduino works is you write your code in C++. C++ you have a function called setup that gets called by the Arduino framework when your application starts. In this case, we just set up the serial port to send data back to um, back to our computer. Then you have a loop method that's called again and again and again and again and again. So it's called loop, 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 continuously, continuously. Now, in here, we're going to add our code to talk to our LED. Now, if you remember from last time, when we do things with uh, with devices connected to our IoT devices. It's all based around pins. So we have GPIO pins. If you look on the back here, we have a load of sockets here. This is GPIO, general purpose input output pins. But all the other sensors that are connected, including built-in sensors, are usually accessed over pins. So what we do in our code is we have to set up the pin and use the pin. We'll go into a bit more detail about how, about how this works after this demo. But we're saying we're setting the, the light pin the WIO light to input, which means we want to read data from this pin. And then what we can do is we can actually read. So we're going to read an analog value from the pin, go into this more detail after demo, but we're going to read the analog value of, of the WIO light pin, and then we're going to print that to the console. And that's kind of all we need to do to, to get going with the sensor. We initialize the pin that it's on, so that we can read data from it, and then we actually read that data. So if I just plug my weir terminal in, so it's upload mode, and then build and upload my code. What this code is doing is reading, waiting five seconds. So every five seconds, it will print out the light value to the console. There you go, and if I just bring up the serial monitor. So say a light value of five. I've got it upside down, we turn it the other way up. So it's up, it's face up, light value 230. If you see here, we're face up, light value 230. I then turn it the other way. No light can get to the sensor. You'll see the light value is dropping. There, you go, back down to five. So that's what it's the a little tiny bit of light is getting from LEDs glowing on the inside of that thing. And then if I if I bring it close to a really bright light, I've got a ring light above my screen here. Bring it close to a really bright light, you see it goes up to 996, so it goes up. So we're measuring light values, just using a couple of lines of code. One set the pin, one to actually read the analog value. So how does this all work? What are we actually doing? What are we actually doing here? Well, there's multiple different, there's two kind of big groups of sensors. There are analog sensors and there are digital sensors. So analog sensors produce a continuous analog signal that is related to the sensed input. So it's not necessarily a, a, a you know, one, zero, one and zero is one zero subs value, it is an analog signal. And it's usually based off of voltage. So in the case of this light sensor, for example, a voltage is sent to a light sensor, the amount of light changes, the resistance of the sensor, and then we'll get different voltage coming back. You also have digital sensors, which are very much kind of an on off type things, a switch, a button. So a button has two values, it's on or it's off. And so with an analog sensor, when I read, I read a voltage. It's usually on a particular scale. I read a number on that scale with a, with a digital sensor, I just read a on off one zero a number that's read. So think about how an analog sensor works. You start with your IT device, it sends a voltage. Most IT devices work on either five volts or 3.3 volts. The voltage goes to the IT device. The IT, the, the sensor will then do something that adjusts the voltage. It will have like a resistor in it or, have, or capacitors or something that will measure that will change the voltage that comes back. And then you read the voltage that comes back. And the difference between the two allows you to work out the value of the sensor. So if you're not, if you're not really up on electronics, and I must confess, I'm not an expert, voltage is the amount of push needed to get electricity from one point to another. There's kind of three properties of electricity. You have voltage, um, ampage and resistance. Voltage is how much is the, the measure of effort need to push it. Then amp is how much you're pushing and resistance is kind of the block behind it. Voltages do not harm you, amps do. So I've had 
hundreds of thousands of volts go through me and you can actually get devices that do that and make your hair stand on end if, if you have any hair um yeah, if you've done if you've got static electricity if you stroked a cat and got a spark that's usually thousands of thousands of volts amps is the one is the one that kills you so you can have tens of thousands of volts through you that you know, milliamps and you're fine you can have a few volts a lot of amps and that can kill you so voltage is just the difference it's how much the, the electrons are jumping around but it's not the measure of the push behind it so another great example is potentiometer that's kind of like the rotation sensor that's the the one of these it's just a, a knob you turn the idea behind it behind this is it basically it's what's called a variable resistor so you put in a voltage twist the knob get a different amount of volts coming out the other side and then you rotate the dial it's kind of a nice way to get uh, a scale of one to you know zero to ten for example if you've used things like volume knobs on stereo equipment same kind of idea it adjusts the resistance <coughs> Ooh, excuse me now oh, a little bit of research for you have a look at some other types of sensors so a lot of temperature sensors use thermistors again we can talk about this tomorrow but I do a bit of research think about a thermistor what is it do some research find out what it is how it works and use and think about that and how that would use for a temperature sensor but also another thing to think about is what if you send too much what if you get a higher voltage back than you send in is it possible for you to put five volts into a sensor and get more out and what might happen if you do that because the thing is it is actually possible you can have external power supplies to sensors and you may get more back so what would happen um think about it do not try it that's like kind of a, a little hint for you do not actually try it. it could be dangerous so with analog sensors they have a voltage they have like a discrete you, know, you turn the knob you get a voltage in a different range now computers don't work on analog computers are digital computers need to take the analog signal and convert that to a digital value that it can understand computers can only do ones and zeros ignoring quantum computers and all that but computers can only do ones and zeros so you need to convert from an analog signal to a digital signal and that's done with an adc an analog to digital converter analog input goes into the adc and you get a digital value come out now a lot of it devices will actually have the adc built in if not a lot of so yeah, sensors well so some um, the so IoT devices will have a built-in ADC, and some sensors work with the ADC on the IoT device, or some have their own built-in. And a lot of this is handled via libraries for you. So you don't have to do anything, you just literally read the value and you will get the number coming back. So we think about our light sensor. Yeah, we're getting these numbers coming through here. We're not getting an analog value of five, two, three, one. That makes no sense to a computer. They need a digital value. So what happens is the analog value is converted through an ADC to a digital value that we can then process. And the ADC, its job is literally to take the analog voltage, give you a digital number that represents that. And a lot of these work on 10 bits. So a lot of ADCs are 10 bit devices and 10 bits allows you to go from zero to 1023. So think about binary, you've got uh, you know, one, two, four, eight, so on. With 10 bits, you get 1023. So, for example, if you've got 3.3 volts going out, one volt coming back in, you get a value of 300 from the ADC. You don't get three, obviously, you don't get the 300 as the analog value, you get digital value of whatever ones and zeros make 300, and that's what you get back. So, a lot of this, say, a lot of this handle is handled transparently. You know, I call analog read here, and I just get back the value from the pin so some internally the ADC on the device does all this kind of stuff for me so digital sensors same idea voltage goes out voltage comes back but there's only two values that you have for the digital sensor high and low is there is, is it the same voltage coming back or is there no voltage coming back that's all you get so with the button if the button's up you get nothing back when it's down you get the same voltage back and that, and that then simply gets converted to one or zero. Now it's it, it picks kind of like a halfway point. So one example would be the Raspberry Pi connects a button onto that at 3.3 volts. It uses 1.8 volts as the on-off point. 
So if you've got more than 1.8 volts coming back, it's on, less, it's off. It kind of has to pick a cutoff. It's not just, you can't, because you will always lose a certain amount of power due to the resistance. It gets converted to heat when just running through wires. So you put five volts out, you won't get exactly five volts back. It's close, but maybe not, it's not exactly right. Especially more advanced sensors, we use some of that power. So it just, it usually picks up a half a halfway point and then uses that. And just measure the voltage, is that above the halfway one, it's below is zero. Now, digital sensors can be a lot more advanced. They can do a lot more things and they can read analog sensors and convert them and output a whole load of pure digital data that you can then read in your device. So for example, going back to the BME 280 sensor, the famous temperature pressure humidity sensor, this has got three sensors on it. So come on, focus. You can do it. Come on camera, you can focus. There we go. So there's three sensors on here. It's a pressure, temperature, and humidity. And so to get the value out of here, it has to be a digital sensor. You have to be able to do a digital read from it. And so what you do is when you connect this, the way it communicates and it, uh, is use a thing called, um, I think this, this is SPI in this one, but it's what you communicate with a certain way using digital protocol. And then that way you will get hold of the data and you'll read back a whole stack of data that contains the three values. So it'll all be handled for you in library code. You won't have to do anything, um, but in the library code, you would have code that would then pull back the whole, all the digital values, and then you can then pull out, I just want the temperature, I just want the humidity. And from your library code, you just get back the three values. Obviously, if you wanted to do this yourself, you'd have to write code to communicate with it, pull back the ones and zeros and, and decode that. But a lot of it's all done for you in libraries. So it's un under the hood, it's all analog, it's using, you know, uh, thermistors which measure changes in resistance based off temperature and other such devices that will change the voltage, converts it to digital, and then gives you back a digital signal. Uh, so question, I see there are multiple hardware kits to choose from. Which one would you recommend that most resembles real IoT hardware? Depends, absolutely depends. Real IoT hardware covers a huge, huge range of things absolutely huge range of things. I mean, you mentioned transmitting over low power radio such as LoRa. Not all IoT devices do that. If you use them like a wide deployment in things like a farm, yes, LoRa is a great way to, to send data around. And then for that, you would want an IoT kit that's based around a microcontroller that use, that drain, draws as low power as possible. If you're doing deployment in a factory, power might not, might not be a consideration because you may have a lot of power. So um, you, know, you may not need to worry about something running off a coin cell battery for three years or what have you. You also may have good Wi-Fi coverage in a factory. You may have 5G coverage. Uh, a lot of IoT devices now are coming with 5G capabilities in kind of commercial use. So you can use internal 5G networks. Um, you know, microcontrollers, they're low powered. Probably there's more microcontrollers in the world than single board computers but you can buy Raspberry Pi compute modules that are used for more advanced workloads, more advanced IoT solutions. Um, so really, it's they're all good. They all they all have use. They all have real world um, usage. Probably microcontrollers more. So if you go down, if you want to go down like the Arduino route, that will give you kind of more of an idea of what's closer to the real world, including the constraints. Because when you're using things like microcontrollers, you have very little memory very easy to, you know, to blow out the memory. We looked at this in the office hours last time. You're capturing a photo. The image that was captured was bigger than the entire memory capacity of, the, of an Arduino device. So if you want to learn more about the constraints and it's probably you want to go down the microcontroller route. It, again, Arduino doesn't really resemble the real world because it's unlikely you'd use Arduino in a production deployment. You would use something that's very specific to the hardware you'd build and you probably build more of a, um, you probably design your hardware the way you want it pick the process the way you want it, pick maybe a real-time operating system or a framework that's close to the hardware that you've chosen. So there's, they're all, it, it, it depends. Um, again, there's also, what's, what do you care about? What do you want to learn? Um, you know, if, you, if you're if you interested in how IoT fits together, how you want to get data from a device to the cloud and process it, a Raspberry Pi and Python is a great way to get going. Because you're pulling sensor data, sending it to the cloud, and you're focusing on the cloud side application of it. So yeah, it, it depends. I know it's very much a wishy-washy answer, but really it depends. Um, probably microcontroller route is probably the closest, I think, what you're thinking about. Um, grab yourself an Arduino device uh, with a bit of hardware, maybe set yourself a Ballora gateway if you want to do that. Um, and then, yeah, 
I hope that answers your question. I know it seems very, very vague, but really, there are all this all this hardware is used in industrial settings, uh, or used in com commercial settings, or um, you know, digital agriculture, manufacturing. They're all used in these kind of settings, so they all have value. Um, but probably sounds like what what you're thinking about microcontrollers probably the way will be the way to go. Great question, though. Really good question. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so talking about digital digital sensors. So using digital sensors to actually um, pull more advanced data out and give it ways to um, and give you ways to handle that. So you do get some very advanced sensors that really need digital data coming off them. Yeah, you could get away with, you know, having a temperature sensor that's analog, you know, and at what a device has got at temperature and humidity and pressure. Yeah, you could probably do something analog there. But I mean, things like a camera absolutely cannot do analog data for camera data. You think about a camera, this device has got to capture light, convert that the light data into pixel data, maybe compress that into something like a JPEG to shrink it down, and then send that data really quickly to an IoT device. That's got to be a stream of digital data running really quickly. That can't be analog data. So you need to use, um, you, know, you need, need to have digital sensor kind of under the hood. Digitals, they allow you to do things like encryption. Uh, it's more immune to noise. You know, if you've got an analog value, you can get potential for fluctuations. If you have a poor poor connection, you know, it could kind of wobble a little bit potentially in terms of the value. Digital doesn't do this. You know, it's, it's one or zero, that's it. So you've got less chance of noise getting in the way. Um, one thing I always find comical is, is, when, is when the overly expensive hi-fi equipment where it sends a digital signal and they claim that this particular hi-fi cable because of its gold lined whatever happens to sound warmer and better than this other digital hi-fi cable it's like it's a digital cable that sends exactly the same ones and zeros it's just utter snake oil um so you, you don't get any impact analog signals things like speaker wires that carry analog signals yes it can make a difference the wiring digital signals no zero difference digital signal one or zeros Okay, so that's sensors. That's how we sense the real world. How do we then interact back with the real world? And this is where actuators came in. So actuators are devices, kind of like the opposite of sensors. The sensor senses the world, an actuator does some kind of impact back on the world. So instead of converting from a physical property of the world to an electrical signal, it converts from electrical signal into an action that changes the physical property of the real world. So you can kind of almost think like for every sensor, there is an equal and opposite actuator in some ways. So for example, an LED. Yeah, we have a light sensor that measures the amount of light coming in. We have an LED that sends light out. We can have a microphone, measures the volume of sound coming in. We have a speaker, sound going out. Things like we have a button, an on off switch that detects whether you press it or not. We have a relay that turns on or off based on electrical signal. We have cameras to capture visual information. We have screens to show this information. We have rotation sensors that measure how much you rotate something. We have stepper motors where you control the rotation. So it's kind of like for every, say, every sensor is almost like there's an opposite actuator. And in some cases, they are exactly the same thing. So for example, a speaker and microphone, they are fundamentally the same. You can use a speaker as a microphone and a microphone as a speaker. Depends whether you're sending power in or sending in um, sending in sound. Same with a motor and a generator. If you put electricity into a motor, it produces motion. If you put motion into a motor, it produces electricity. So they are kind of, in, uh, one is the, is the inverse of the other in kind of a real world way, which I think is pretty cool. So before we talk more about actuators, let's actually use one. Let's actually get going and build our nightlight. And the actuator we're going to use is a is an LED. So the idea behind the night light is when the light level is too low, then the LED comes on. So let's zip back over to the camera. So the LED I'm going to be using is this here. So this WEA terminal uses the um, Grove hardware. So the light sensor is built in, but the LED is not built in. This one doesn't have an LED on it which is bizarre because LEDs are kind of the canonical IoT sensor. It's kind of, my first IoT project is usually lighting an LED. But we can connect an LED to these growth ports on the bottom. 
So the whole point of this growth kit is to make it easy to add sensors and not worry too much about electronics, you know, blowing things up, stuff like that. So this here is a Grove LED. So green, this one's green. You can actually unplug these, plug in different ones. And it's got a variable resistor here to adjust the brightness and then a socket I can use to connect it. Now, an LED is a light emitting diode. And a diode, for those of you who are not uh, au fait with electronics, is a electrical component that sends electricity one way. So you can only, the electrical signal can only go one way through it. It will not go back the other way. Kind of like a, a water valve. Um, so you have one that lets water in one way, doesn't let it flow back the other way. Um, the valves on tires, if you ever pumped up tires on a bicycle or on, um, you know, flotation devices for use in the swimming pool. You can blow air in and the act of blowing in opens the valve, the air goes in, but the air doesn't come back out the other way. Same idea, it's just these diodes emit light. So the common, a common first mistake with LEDs is to plug it in the wrong way around. And it's not gonna, focusing is terrible. But on LEDs, you either have, got one here. you'll see, here's an LED here, you see it's got two pins that are different lengths. So they either have different length pins to indicate which is the positive and negative, or sometimes one side will be flatter. So I don't know if we can get focus on this. I don't know if you can see, but the, the plus side is perfectly round. On the other side, it's slightly flatter. I can get a good angle to kind of show this. Slightly flatter. If it were to focus, you'd probably better see that. There we go, so slightly flatter. So that's how you know which way around to put it in. And it's kind of a, a common first, why is my LED not working? It's because it's plugged in the wrong way around. Now, one great thing about this growth kit is I can plug this LED in and it will work and, it won't, and nothing will go wrong, um, which is good because LEDs don't need as much power. So here, for example, if I was doing this the old fashioned way with a breadboard and just connecting LED directly to an IoT device, you'll notice I have to, I've got a resistor here. If I just were wired this LED directly to the power that comes out of, say, for example, a Raspberry Pi, you start to see maybe a bit of smoke coming out. You blow up the LED. Yeah, probably wouldn't start a fire, um, but, you know, not worth the risk. So you have to put a resistor in there to reduce the current. Otherwise, things can go badly wrong. And what's nice about this growth kit is all that problem goes away. I just plug it in. This is why I, I, I picked the seed hardware to build this IT for beginners course. I don't want anyone to have to worry about soldering resistors, blowing up hardware. Plug and play and let's focus on the actual implementation of IoT, not the, uh, not the electrical engineering side. So this one, plug that in there and I plug that in. Uh, which, one, which port? And I plug it in. Yeah, so that's my LED all plugged in. Cool. Now, <clears throat> these LEDs are digital actuators, same as the um, same as a button. It's kind of got one zero value. It's either on or off. Light is going in, light is coming off. Um, before I dive in, let me just come to this question. Uh, New peer, apologize for asking something silly. If you're using a pay-as-you-go cloud-based ML model versus Edge to interpret video data from a camera sensor, what are the cost implications? As I believe video information is more dense. Um, it's expensive, <laughs> basically. Um, live video analytics is more expensive than running it on the edge. Um, your cost impl implications include bandwidth, because obviously you're shipping data up to the cloud. So if you're thinking about this from a corporate rollout perspective or you know, big factory, 20 video cameras, you've got to upload all that data to the cloud. So you're paying for the bandwidth for that. Um, and then, yes, you are paying on a per minute, per second basis for the video to be analyzed. Um, so if you go for page, you go, <clears throat> if you do it in the cloud, then yes, you do pay per minute for what you're doing. The upside to that, of course, is you can take advantage of pre built models in the cloud. You don't have to pay anyone to build models. You don't have to manage it yourself. So all your costs are is writing your code and managing your devices that get the data up into the cloud. You don't have any more costs there except paying per minute in the cloud. If you run it on the edge, then you've got no cloud costs for doing the analytics, but you have to obviously maintain those devices, pay for the hardware, manage the hardware, manage backups, 
um, you know, have people on site to manage them. In general, running on the edge will be substantially cheaper. Train the model in the cloud, deploy it to the edge, and that will be substantially cheaper than paying in the cloud. If you're just playing around, if you want to learn, learn in the cloud, but running on the edge would be substantially cheaper. Um, obviously, you've got the whole issue of what if my, you know, what if I lose power? How do I do backups? Things like that. You have to manage that. Um, some of those issues go away just by the very nature of being on the edge. For example, if all the power to your building goes out, then your security cameras aren't going to work anyway. So it doesn't matter. You don't need a backup for your edge devices that runs when the power's off because your cameras are off already anyway. Um, but yeah, no, it's a very, very good question. Cost is a huge thing when it comes to cloud computing. And with IoT, where you can run things on the edge, that really changes the cost dynamic. You use the cloud to, to train and just pay for training costs and you run things locally and you save yourself an absolute fortune on um, cloud costs. So yeah, play around in the cloud, deploy to the edge because it is substantially cheaper as long as you've got the infrastructure and capabilities to manage those devices. Another great question, another great question. Cool. So yeah, LEDs are digital actuators. They have a one and zero value. You send, you set a value and it either lights up or goes off. And again, it's connected to a pin. So in this case, we connected to pin D0, digital pin on the Wii terminal. In fact, if I, let me just bring up the Wii terminal. Uh, oh, that one there, wrong one. There we go. Give me a second. I just shut the we have the pin diagram for your terminal. Is it in this link? No, it is on this one here. Where are we? Yeah. So these are the two sockets in the bottom of the Wii terminal. Just zoom in a bit. There we go. So these are the two sockets on the bottom, and you'll see there's D0, D1, A0, A1. So these are output, digital, and analog. So output is zero, analog is, is one. So we set this to, Z, to D0. This is saying we want this to use as a digital pin, we can send a digital signal. We can get and we can set up analog devices here as well to read analog values if you want to, and that then routes it through the ADC and gives us access to it. The moment we want the digital one, and it's there's digital signal. Uh, we can use the other side as digital as well, or a thing called I squared C, which will as um, outside the scope of this lesson. Uh, but yeah, we want we use this one here, and this is our digital zero. Um, but the same socket can be used digital or analog input or output. So we set this one output D0 output that's what we want that sets up a pin and then the way we do our lighting what we do is you measure the light value and I just picked 300 for now because that's a nice easy value to use we could obviously change that if we wanted to and then if our light is less than 300 so if the signal come back to less than 300 we send a high signal to our LED and that will light the LED otherwise we send low same as when we measured from a sensor I was, I was saying it's Kind of high is five volts, low is zero volts. Same kind of idea here. So when we send high, it says send all the powers. When we send low, we send 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 no power. So if I just put my device into upload mode and upload that new code, done. If I go back to our serial monitor, the light value is five, and you'll see my LED is lit. Now, saying this is a variable resistor, uh, variable resistor here, I can actually turn this with a screwdriver. Uh, not that screwdriver, that was too small. One second. Grab my big box of screwdrivers and let's try and find the right one. <clears throat> is, it, is this one going to work? There we go. So you can see I turned it and it went off.
So that puts the control of the, the light on the board there, not in my code. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's lit up. Now if I turn this over, uh, I set it to 300 and we were seeing before light values, that's 157, 158. So it's still dark enough that the LED is lit. Um, I need some brighter light, I need some brighter light. You know what? The best thing, let's change it. Let's change this to 100. Let me upload that. So what's the problem with these demos is you know, don't know how much light there's going to be until, you, until the day. Uh, you know, I've got a blind behind me that's shut. And, uh, you know, when I did this before, 300 was fine because I had my blinds open. And now I've got them shut. There you go. So now I've got light, one, light value of 160 and the LED is off. And if I cover that up, give it the five seconds. There we go. You can see the lights come off, come on, and then I take my hand off it. And the light goes off. So we've built a basic night light, the same as my, my eight year old has got uh, in our hallway. So when it gets dark, it lights up so she can see in the night if she wakes up in the middle of the night. We built a basic night light using a sensor and an actuator. We've got that kind of feedback loop going on. Read from the sensor, control the actuator. So let's dig a bit more into actuators. So actuators, they have some form of energy source going in, some electricity, maybe a control signal that controls what they do, and then they do something. They convert it to motion or some kind of interaction. And again, there's analog the actuators and there's digital actuators. And this is all about that kind of physical happening in the real world based on electrical signal. There's a whole lot of different types of actuators. So again, some research for you to do. We can talk about this in the office hours tomorrow. There's pneumatic sensors, hydraulic sensors, electric sensors, thermal sensors, magnetic sensors. Um, sorry, actuators. Um, yeah, pneumatic actuators, hydraulic actuators, electric actuators, thermal actuators, magnetic actuators. So what change? how do these work? How do they affect change? What does a magnetic actuator do when you put electrical signals to it? So something to research, and again, we can talk about this in the office hours tomorrow. So let's talk about analog actuators, analog ones. Same, same kind of idea as an analog sensor, just in reverse. You have a digital to analog converter, a DAC, takes a digital signal from your IoT device and converts that to a voltage. And that could be one classic example is just a light. Um, obviously, with our LED, we, we had a little dial that we pressed to um, to set the different that set, set the different different um, light intensity of the LED. But if you had one that you could control by code, you could do that. So you put a small voltage, the light lights up a little bit full voltage, it, um, it lights up all the way. So again, same idea, digital signal from IT device, digital analog converter, analog signal goes to the device. Speakers are an analog signal. You know, when you have when you have noise, that's analog. So you kind of get the different sounds coming out all by sending different voltages through. Now, one problem you have with kind of analog signals is how do you send certain analog signals to certain devices, including things like, things like motors can be a bit of fun for this. A motor, is an actuator that spins. So here's one here. Here's a motor. It's got two connections there. Down there. You put electricity through that, and this bit goes around. And it spins. Loads of uses for a motor. I mean, here's one. I've got a very controlled car here, controlled by a Raspberry Pi RT device. And that's got in the back here two motors to power the wheels. And then it's got a special type of motor called a stepper motor on the front here to control the steering. Now motors, you put electricity in, they spin as fast as they can spin and that's it. So how do you control the speed of a motor? How do you send a digital signal that's got some kind of speed information into control of how fast a motor spins? And that's done using a thing called pulse width modulation. And the idea of pulse width modulation is you send a, you send a little bit of power and the thing happens, then you stop, then you stop. Then a little bit of power, the thing happens, then you stop. And if you do that quick enough, then you end up with a motor spinning at a relatively slow speed or whatever speed you want. It's kind of, think of it a bit like somebody running across the screen on your TV. This person doesn't move, it's flat image, flat image, flat image, flat image. And it's just in each image, the person moves slightly. And you kind of, your brain fills in, kind of the same with the motor. But a little bit of power, the motor spins, 
And then power comes off, the motor starts to slow down, a little bit of power it spins, a little bit of power, and it comes constantly just nudging, a little bit of power. And you do it so fast that the motor then spins at the speed you want. The, the smaller the period of time you send the power, the bigger the gaps, the slower the motor spins. And you do this so often that you don't notice. You won't see the spin, you won't, you won't see it kind of ticking because you do it so fast. And so that's how you can convert a digital signal into like a speed of a motor. What's well, the same thing with speakers when you're sending audio? Yeah, you don't necessarily send an analog signal from a digital device. You instead send pulse with modulation. You, you send these different pulses and that causes the speaker to move and gets the sound. It actually works the same in reverse. So if you have like a, um, a microphone, that actually works by reading discrete values. This this actually writes these discrete values. So it's actually get this kind of speed. So there's kind of a whole of these different tricks you have to do to convert from the analog signal that you get from, so the digital signal you get from IoT device into some kind of analog feedback on an analog actuator. So, yeah, it's worth digging more into this. This is a bit of fun, pulse with modulation. So got a bit of time to dig into this again. We can talk to this office hours tomorrow. Now, digital actuators, they work same as digital uh, sensors. You have on or off. You send voltage, comes on, turn the voltage off, it gets off, on or off. And that's basically it. We saw this with the LED. We sent a high value. We sent the 3.3 volts the rear terminal works at to the LED, it lights up. It's a low value, zero volts, the light goes out. Now, this is, these kind of digital ones kind of two state actuators. So they can be on or off. So again, something to think about. We can talk about this tomorrow. What are, what are some other examples? Things like solenoids. Uh, so do a bit of research. Have an idea about how these different electrical on off devices can work. And that's kind of it. That's kind of wrapping up a little bit about sensors and actuators and how we interact with the physical one. So kind of think about a challenge. Yeah, we talk, we've talked before about different kind of IT devices you may have in your house. So think about those, kind of a challenge. Again, we can talk about this in the office house tomorrow. Think about the IT device you might have in your house. Yeah, think about what sensors and actuators they're connected to and what purpose do they have? Kind of how do you control, how do you interact with the physical world with those IT devices? My canonical example is the temperature sensor, the thermostat. I've got one in my house. I have multiple thermostats around my house. These are analog sensors. They, they take a temperature value that adjusts the resistance of electrical signal. They convert that to a digital value that they then use to tell me how hot or cold my house is. And then depending on that value, it either turns on my heating or my air conditioning system and turns, controls a fan blows all the, all the heat or hot air or cold air through the house. And so there's an actuator, there's a digital switch. Not, I, I don't know exactly how it's implemented, it's buried inside a furnace that I do not touch because I don't want to end up you know, ruining it. But there's some kind of switch where electrical signal will come from a control box to say, turn on the heating, turn on the aircon. So there'll be something there that controls this. So the actuator is some kind of digital switch that turns that on and that will turn all the power. Now, a classical digital switch, I'll show you these because these are fun, is a relay. These are kind of the canonical digital switch. This is a relay here. So a relay has a magnetic switch inside here. What you do is you send an electrical signal to it and the switch comes on. And that switch then controls, that electrical, it controls electricity flowing through it. So what I'd use here, I'll connect this. This is the Grove connector. I'll connect this to my device and then I'll connect power through this terminal block here. Put power through there. This can take kind of mains voltage power if I wanted it to. And then I can send a signal here to say turn the switch on. You actually hear an audible click from in here. Click on as a magnet fires up which moves a switch. Switch moves, clicks the switch on and then connects these two terminals and then the power goes through the device which is pretty cool. So this is an electrical switch. This is a classic way of turning on power to, to a device. It takes a very low voltage to control the switch and then this can take you know mains voltage going through it. So there'll be something like this inside my furnace that takes a signal from an I, the IoT device to say turn it on and that will send the power to turn the fan on. So again think about the kind of IoT devices you have in your house, what kind of sensors and actuators they might have 
uh, in place. And that is interacting with the physical world with sensors and actuators. Um, so again, this is all covered in IT beginners. So if you want to go through that, go in more detail. We do dive into a bit more detail about how uh, the various different bits and pieces work, but you can find all that in IT for beginners. Um, and yeah, with that, thank you very much. We're back in tomorrow for office hours. If we can go through the things we talked about, some of that, the homework, and I can show you the same nightlight demo using a virtual IT device and a Raspberry Pi, so we kind of see all that working. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and then, yeah, any questions? I've got a bit of time to answer answer questions. Uh, our lesson three office hours in episode four, both at 9 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. Yes. Um, episode four is Wednesday. So in the, both occur at the same time. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, so tomorrow is office hours for today. So again, we can, can answer anything. It doesn't have to be specific to what we talked about today. It can answer any questions that, that you want. Um, and I'll say I'll do the demos of the nightlight with the Raspberry Pi and the virtual IT device. And then Wednesday, we'll be doing episode four. And Wednesday is connecting devices to the internet. Now, we're not going to actually look at any cloud services for this. We're just going to look at MQTT, the, kind of the, the fundamental connectivity, and just kind of talk about uh, talk about that. Um, and obviously, if you want to learn more, the rest of our teeth is everything there. Um, Randy, thank you very much. Um, is there a page list all the upcoming lectures? Uh, yes. Yep, we'll just uh, we'll drop that in the in the chat. Um, if you signed up for the check in at the start, we will send you a list of what well, we can sign up to our newsletter and actually get a list of all the stuff that we cover. Um, the page has just, just been put there. That's the rest of this series. And we want a whole lot of other other stuff as well um, around IoT and kind of all manner of cloud computing and developer topics uh, through the reactor. But um, yep, the, if you follow the link there, then that was not only got what's coming up uh, this week, but also there's links to the videos from last week if you want to catch up with that. Um, but yeah, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, no more questions, then we can carry on discussing this at the office hours um, tomorrow. But yeah, thank you for your time and um, I will see you. See you tomorrow. Thank you.